Hello everybody, story time with Dutchman Tell, and I'm going to get out of the way very, very quickly. We've got books, we've got t-shirts, you know the whole spiel and jazz and everything, but I want to introduce <laughs> Dutch, who is going to introduce our very, very special guest indeed. Take it away. We have a guest today that I have known for years and years and years, and I've been talking to James and I said, I need to get, I, I need to get him on the show. And I think James has interviewed uh, this this gentleman before, and his name is Al Snow. He's sitting by in Louisville, Kentucky right now. Uh, Al, how you doing? I'm doing great, Dutch, and thank you for having me on the show. I really well, appreciate loved it. To, love to have you on the show. But first, I might uh -huh. have to I, I might have to swear you in with the wrestler's code of honor. Do you swear <laughs> okay. to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? So help you, uh, K-Fabe? Yes or no? <laughs> So oh, help me, see, Now he's taken the oath, so he's highly indoctrinated into what we're doing here. Uh, Al, are you okay? I, I, I mentioned right before we went on the air that from the time I remember, I haven't seen you in a long, long time. Yeah, it's but been I, a while, hasn't it? Oh, a, a long time. But I've kept yeah. track of you, and but your voice sounds different. Yeah, now I sound like Christian Bale doing Batman all the time. So. <laughs> Like I'm so, the vengeance, you know. So what happened? I had uh, severe hiccups, chronic hiccups for about three weeks, 24 really? hours a day, seven days a week. It was probably one of the worst things I've ever experienced in my entire life. Uh, I barely slept for three weeks, barely ate. Um, and they, uh, they gave me antipsychotic medicine to help get rid of oh them. so they knew they knew you huh yeah 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 and i mean it's like, <laughs> like some heavy stuff you know what i mean like really really heavy stuff so i and i can't even eat gummies uh i can't even eat edibles and they because they weird me out so the uh i had some really uh interesting dreams uh I bet we remember uh kevin fertig um yeah he was uh we went up right after i got the hiccups were you know, I was on these uh, antipsychotics and we went to a wrestling convention in Indianapolis and he and his wife, Katie, Kevin, let us stay in his house. Typically Dutch, like if I stay at somebody's home, I try to be as unobtrusive as possible. You know what I mean? Just, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be a, a problem. So I'm laying there asleep in the middle of the night. I wake up and I'm, I've had this dream that and now keep in mind i'm on antipsychotic medicine so i have this dream that i'm planning this celebration and i gotta find i don't know what this is but i gotta find it and if i find it it's some tool it's gonna be the best day ever right so i wake up out of the dream i gotta go to the bathroom i'm only in my underwear right i don't even think about it i normally i'd put on some sweatpants or something so if i run into anybody in the house you know i'm not just in my underwear I go in the bathroom, I go to the restroom and all of a sudden I'm, I go to leave and I go, wait a minute, I got to find this. You know, if I find that it's going to be the best day ever. So I start, I go through their whole bathroom, all their cabinets, all their medicine cabinets. I go through the shower. I take the lid off the tank of the toilet, right? Looking for this. And now am I done? No. I now proceed to go into Katie and Kevin's bedroom and start searching their closets and their nightstands while they're laying in bed awake, watching me do this. So then I go down the hallway, I go in their daughter's bedroom. I went through all the bedrooms upstairs, couldn't find it. So I went downstairs in the kitchen, went through all of their drawers, all of their cabinets, the stove, the refrigerator, and then went throughout the rest of the house. I spent about an hour, hour and a half searching the house, looking for this. And then, thinking I was awake the whole time and then went back to bed and uh, woke up the next morning. And so was telling them, they didn't, they didn't wake you up during this. No, in fact, and I didn't know they were awake until the next morning. I was telling everybody what I had done. I said, I feel terrible. You know, I was wandering around your house and Kevin's like, Oh yeah, we laid there and watched you go into the closet and everything. I go, why didn't you say something? He said, I we didn't want to wake you up. We didn't. I said, well, I thought I was awake the whole time. But well, they may have realized uh, you're like sleepwalking. Yeah, and you, you got to be careful waking people up like that. Yeah, because I've I've done that before. Like in Memphis, I used to walk outside my room and walk around just just in my shorts. Would you really? 
on, on the like the the walkway and yeah, people yeah. would see me and then i would go i wouldn't be out there long but yeah. but i would i i know what it what it what it is listen yeah. you own a company now yes how valley wrestling did you I, uh, let me ask you do you ever see yourself by owning your own promotion no i did not i i didn't um it was not uh necessarily the plan it just kind of I guess it was meant to be because it just kind of all fell together. You know, I was, I was here in Louisville, Kentucky. And, um, at the time I was, I gotta be honest, I was getting a little frustrated with, with wrestling, uh, with the business in itself uh, that there were no standards anymore as far as training or development of, uh, the next generation of wrestlers. Mm -hmm. Um, and, because, you know, to be quite honest, I was, uh, I'd go to an independent show and I'm not, you know, we, we, we know aesthetically, cosmetically, because the wrestling business is an aesthetic business. You know, we need to be able to, you know, portray that we're prize fighters the minute we walk through the curtain, you know. Uh, so I'm not even going to get into the aesthetic part, but there were, there are so many people now that are in the wrestling business that, Physically, they are just not in the proper condition to perform safely and respectfully, both for themselves and for their opponent. I mean, I, I watch these young men and women are in the ring and they're so blown up in six, seven minutes. And now they're going to try to do that big high spot that they saw on Raw this week. And hey, then it, they, took ten, know, it, it took 15 years for me to blow up in six minutes. <laughs> but I, yeah. but I finally accomplished the fact. So this really, what you're answering now, kind of leads me into my next question: the state yeah. of the wrestling business today. Yeah, and you were you were kind of describing it. So continue. Well, wasn't it? Well, you know, you remember back in the day, it was very difficult to be a get in the business. It was it was. I tell people all the time, and they think I'm kidding, but it was it's easier to be a made man in the mafia than it was to become a professional wrestler. A lot of times. Mm -hmm. And, and a large part of that was because, you know, people were held accountable for whoever they taught or trained, whoever they brought in the business. That's gone away. And, you know, I was talking to my wife and she's a licensed masseuse. And we were, I was talking about, you know, the regulations and all these things that she had to go through to get to be a licensed masseuse. And I thought, you know, this is, it's absurd. It's insulting. Quite honestly, we have wrestling commissions around the country. And if you want to be a licensed barber, you want to be a licensed uh, mm -hmm. hairstylist, anything you want to, you want to be a licensed mortician. You've got to go to a state accredited school. You've got to be taught by a state accredited teacher. You've got to complete a certain number of required hours of training then you've got to have a certain amount of residency training, which is where you're supervised experience. Then you get to take a test mm -hmm. and get a license. If you in any state in the, that has a commission, whether it's Missouri, Louisiana, uh, Alabama, uh, South Carolina, Kentucky, uh, you go to any one of those states and you want to be a wrestler, all you got so, to do is. So Kentucky a, still has an athletic commission or a wrestling oh, commission? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really? definitely. Oh, yeah. They got rid of and it at one time, I know. They did, and then because of nonsense and shenanigans, it was brought back. And mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, but the only requirement you have to be a professional wrestler is you got to just take a physical. Yeah, and I just thought, I thought that was insulting. So I went to the board of directors. You know, I'd, I'd approached Maryland and a couple other commissions. And I was like, why don't you develop a training license? have a certain number of required hours, have the people that train have to pass a certain standards test, you know, so that you can you know, up the, up the uh, quality of, of what's being trained out there. Mm -hmm. They just kind of blew me off. Oh yeah. And at the time I was hanging out with in OVW with Danny and Danny got to talking and uh, he was ready to retire. And one thing led to another and uh, you know, I ended Danny, up you know what, Danny, Danny Davis. Danny Davis, yeah. yeah. And uh, myself and I had two partners at that time. We bought Danny out and bought OVW in 2018. And, you know, I, start, and I started trying to raise the standards back up. 
we're the only Dutch, we're the only training facility in the world where we're accredited by the State Office of Proprietary Education uh, in the state of Kentucky as a trade school for professional wrestling, sports entertainment, and broadcasting. Wow. No one else. Congratulations. Thank you. Took about two and a half, three years to get it. No kidding. Uh, Yeah. But we were able to get, you know, that designation as an actual accredited trade school. And um, you, do you, you know, have diplomas? Uh, you have certificates of completion because it's a trade school. It's not a uh, university or a, uh, so it'd be oh. no different than like a beauty college or, so you know, you know uh, where this publishing. is going, James, <laughs> I, I have that? a university, Al, oh, do it's you? called the university of Dutch. And just for yeah. you, I have, yes, I got to show it to you. Oh, the university. Oh, the University Fantastic. of Dutch that is available, by the way. Yes, <laughs> but that's actually a good-looking diploma. I'll make you one. That I'll is, make you yes, one please. and send it to you, and I'll make one for your that. school and just copy yes. it. and you got it. So that would be awesome. It's like somebody says, "You know so much about wrestling. Where did you get your education from?" And they can say, "I got mine from the University of Dutch." What would you call your school? <laughs> what What would you call your university or college? It's uh, OVW Academy. See? And that would look really, really good right there. That would. I, that I would. will definitely, I will put it up in the office. That's for sure. So, Al, let me ask you, where are you from? Originally, I'm from uh, Lima, Ohio, a little town <laughs> in northwest Ohio. I remember riding up and down the road with you, and yeah. we were talking about Lima, and we would just go on and on yeah. and on. and on. The, the bullshit never stopped. Oh, that's yeah, why. The, that's why the trips were short. They yep. could be long, but the bullshit could have been so good. Oh that, yeah, that that you didn't mind it. Uh, when you when we were riding with Barry Horowitz, and you would just torture him. <laughs> <laughs> remember the time? Uh, remember this was back when we still had pay phones. And remember, Barry always had to call home at a certain time on the road. Didn't matter where we were at. Yeah, we'd have to stop at a gas station. And that one night. He was in the payphone booth, and Bradshaw pulled the car up and blocked the doors with the bumper and started hitting the horn. <laughs> and oh, yeah. He, I, I remember went that. went nuts in the payphone booth, just yelling and screaming. Oh, he, he But those were, that were, those were fun times, though. Oh, I yeah, mean, it was were. interesting, and it was a real, it didn't hurt anybody. It was a, yeah. but it just upset Barry. Of course, we took, we, we, we took delight in that, and he <laughs> knew we were kidding, so it wasn't really mean yeah. to him. So, no, not at all. Okay, Lima is in the state of Ohio, yes. whose big claim to fame in the mm-hmm. wrestling business was the Sheik. The original was Sheik. well known. Did you ever wrestle the Sheik? I never did wrestle him. I worked on some of his shows when he was at the back end of his, you know, his company was kind of in the downturn, you know, and his career was coming to an end. I remember, okay. though... I was so scared of him as a kid, you know, <laughs> that when I would, when I was in the locker room and he walked in, I'd like freeze, you know, cause I still was like terrified of him. So he was that scary. Oh yeah. Yeah. He was believable, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He was terrifying. Wow. I've heard yeah. now the Sheik had a territory based out of Detroit, correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The main, and they did big business at one time. Yeah, the uh, Ohio-Michigan territory was always historically a really big money territory, even back during the days in the 40s and in the 30s, because um, no other rule, not many other states, like there are major population centers. Toledo is literally uh, two hours north of Dayton, Ohio. It's an hour south of Detroit, you mm-hmm. know, but it's a major population center. Uh, Dayton is a major population center that's uh, an hour and a half away from Cincinnati, straight down I-75. Um, Cincinnati is an hour and a half from Columbus, which is another major population center. And then Columbus is an hour and a half from Cleveland, which is another major population center. And then K- Canton, Youngstown is a major population center. And then Akron. So you've got all those major uh, c- cities where they are, you know, you can draw huge audiences. And the same goes for Michigan. You had Detroit, you had Saginaw, you had, you know, all these large cities. And it was in the in the Rust Belt, in the uh, automotive, where the automotive industry was really big. 
you know, and Sheik made a lot of money for a lot of years there running that territory. Well, well how did, let me bring this up. Did you ask the Sheik how to get in the business or how did you get in the business? Or did you have the uh, nerve to even approach the Sheik? Oh, no way. No, no. <laughs> I, uh, when I was 14, I decided I wanted to be in the business. So I would walk to the local because we didn't have Google or any of that stuff back then. So I walked to the public <laughs> library. I would get the Bill After magazines and um, religiously, and then I would uh, I'd see, like I'd see that Crockett's promotion was in Charlotte, North Carolina. You know, Sheik's was in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Vern Gagne's was the AWA was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So they had the white pages uh, for each one of those major cities mm -hmm. at the library. So I would go and I'd, I'd go down and find AWA. I'd find Crockett promotions. And how old were you? 14. <laughs> I'd write the number down. I'd walk back home. And then once a month I would call, I'd go down the list and I'd call every one of them once a month asking them to train me. And then they got to the point where they would reckon, you know, some of the office people would recognize me and either hang the phone up or they'd leave me on hold or they'd get bored and they'd talk to me and rib me and mess around with me. And, uh, so who did train you? Well, uh, a guy by the name of Jim Lancaster. Uh, I know him. Yep. He, uh, he's passed away now, business. right? Huh? No, no, he's still alive. Oh, he's, okay. He's still alive. He, uh, he uh, was starting to, he was coming off, he had just had a, his daughter and he wanted to kind of semi-retire and run his own shows. And uh, I went to him at first and I asked him to, you know, if he'd train me and he told me no. So I yeah, go, go check with Al Costello, Al's up in Detroit. He's training some guys. And I happened to get a hold of Gene Anderson in Crockett's office mm -hmm. before I met Jim. And Gene told me that in a couple months, they were going to have a tryout. It was $250 to try out, you know, you can come down to Charlotte. And you were and still 14 out. or 15? Or? Uh, I was 18 now. Okay. I was 18. So I, uh, I, um, saved up my money and I, I put, drove down to, you know, took a bus, took the Greyhound bus, which is cool. What year, what year was this? 1981. Now, two hundred and fifty dollars was a lot of money. It's like a thousand or twelve hundred yeah. now. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you saved your money. You went down. I went down. What happened? What happened? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, show up Sunday morning, right? You know, it's, you're going to have the house show that night. It's Were you excited? Oh, I was. I was excited. I was scared. I was. I was <laughs> wired up like a like a crackhead i was ready to go <laughs> and uh um gene was there and there were maybe 30 40 other guys and uh he gives he comes over and i give him his money and he gives me his this release and sign it kid so i sign it. he's the only one there so it says hold harmless so i write gene anderson in there you know and uh uh we go out we get you know get our workout gear on about 30, 40 of us. And here comes Ole Anderson. Ole's oh my got God. Five, yeah. He's got five guys. He's already training. Right. So then we, they basically, you know what they did. They basically, they're going to blow you up so yeah. they can manhandle you in the ring. They stretch you, send you home. Well, they made it. I, I tell people all the time what we went through and they're like, there's no way. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what we did. Remember how in the back parking lot, I'll never forget that back parking lot kind of went over across and it kind of yep. went up a hill. They went up a little more of a hill and it came down. Yep. I know that because we ran five miles around that damn thing that day to warm up. Now we go back inside. We do 500 squats. Once we get 500 squats done, we got to go run up the, in between the, uh, the seats and back. How down many guys, th how many guys threw up? A oh, lots, bunches of them. <laughs> but we, not we you. Were starting, well, I didn't know. I actually didn't. Surprisingly, I didn't. <laughs> Um, we, uh, um, we started, guys started dropping pretty quick, you know, for the five mile run took 12 or 15 of them off the map real fast. Then the stairs took more off. And then we came down and we had to do 400 push ups. Didn't matter how you got them done. You had to do them. And wow. then you, you, then if it wasn't your turn to go in the ring, you had to stand there and do 
uh, jumping jacks. Then you had to put some on your back, run to the end of the arena and back. That's some big Damn. bastard. And then you get in the ring, you know, and Ole's in there and he immediately comes up and just starts yelling in my face. And, and I'm like 18 year old kid, you know, you and, scare uh, you. Oh, terrified, man. Yeah. <laughs> there, I, I couldn't, you know, and, and Lancaster had worked for Crockett and knew Ole. And he said, I'll tell him I said, hi. So like an idiot, I go, Jim Lancaster's real legal name is Jim Painter. So I go, oh, Jim Painter says hi. He goes, I don't know, though, goddamn Jim Painter. Get in, shut up, get down on the mat. So I'm like, well, that didn't work. So <laughs> I, I got to get in all fours in the amateur position. And then they, he's shoot, he's t- shoot, t- teaching the guys how to belly out a guy, yeah. right behind their leg and rear chin lock, right? He's stretching them. He's stretching everybody. So somehow, Dutch, I, to this day, I don't know how, but I made it through four of them. I finally get to the fifth guy, you know, the guy – gets me and I can't get up. I just can't get away and always scream in my face to give up. I probably would have, but my jaw was clamped shut because the guy had me in a rear chin lock. I couldn't mm-hmm. talk. So he says, do it again. So I almost get away. Only gets mad. Now at this point, you're completely exhausted, right? Intimidated. Only usually gets in the ring with you. And then he hooks you. He usually, you know, sugars you or something and stretches you. And, um, but I had wrote Gene's name on the release. So I get, have to get back down on all fours. Gene gets in and we go at it. He starts fish hooking me, pulling my, you know, digging in my mouth, pulling my hair. And I'm like, what is going on? This guy is just going after me like an animal. And uh, so I start struggling. And at, you know, at some point he tries to grab my nuts. I grab his, I keep a hold of him. He rolls me over, puts his. Now that's smashes, a story. Yeah. <laughs> smashes my nose in the bottom cable of the rope, you know, cause it's just an aircraft broke my nose and I'm holding on for dear life. And he so Gene, Gene in, got mad at you. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he put his thumb in my eye and he's like, do you want to lose an eye kid? And now only becomes the voice of reason. And it's like, Oh, just calm down. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I god blood's Brother. pouring out of my face and gene kicks me in the ass and kicks me out of the ring i came back that night and watched the show uh watched you know valentine and piper in a dog collar match and uh in charlotte watched, uh, yeah cornodal and uh sergeant slaughter big crowd take on, oh yeah sold out now, house. this is you know this was the time that charlotte was hot hot very hot yeah, and they, they were, had they, they had talent and they had were, great angles. Yeah, and that's when they were so talent. hot. So, Stun well, I hate you. There, I hate you, Jake Roberts. Wait a minute, when you train a guy, would you do that? No, no. <laughs> I know why they did it at the time. Oh uh, yeah, they I, blew I you up. It. They blew you up and they stretch oh, you yeah. and then they send you home and that way you can tell everybody you know look this is what it took just to try to get in. So you can imagine how hard, how hard it would be to be in the business. I mean, they were doing it to protect it. Well, they made a good payday that day. Oh, yeah. Those guys paid the same thing, and there was like 20 or 30 of them. There were, yeah. Yeah, they made a lot of money that day. So, all right. What was the first territory you worked? I worked in initially, I worked for, uh, I would go out because, you know, the the way you know, used to, you started as a job guy, you would go just for TVs to try and get your foot in the door. And you worked the independents, right? Well, yeah, the outlaws back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would, I would, and you could keep pretty busy back then on the outlaws, you know, cause you know, they run pretty much five, six days a week. Mm-hmm. So I'd go out and work for Muchnick in, uh, Missouri and Geigel in, in uh, Kansas city mm-hmm. and then, uh, Vern up in Minnesota, George Cannon up in Windsor. Um, and, but they weren't independents. They had, they had regular they had territories, and, right? Yeah, so you were working regular territories then. Those two, yeah, and then oh, Dick the Bruiser, Dick Dick uh, the Bruisers in Indiana, Indiana, and mm-hmm. uh, um, and then occasionally down for Paphos in uh, Eastern Kentucky, you know. So um, I go down there. Where did where did I meet you the first time? WWF? I mean, uh, uh, I think we met before that. Uh, I just can't remember when it was or where it was, but I'm I'm pretty calm. I remember meeting you before that. And then we met back up in um, in WWF in '95. Tell, tell me about your Smoky Mountain days. How did you get oh. there? 
Well, um, you ought to I say know Cornette. You, you ought to say lucky, I guess. I was just lucky. <laughs> I was. I actually was. It's, it, here's the thing, okay? At that point in time, I'd been – I'd started in 1982, and it was 1995. And I had been, you know, not really – Nobody really took notice of me or anything. And a large reason why was because I just, I didn't have a persona personality uh, to sell. You know, I was good in the ring, mm-hmm. but, you know, no, you couldn't describe me. And um, I, at that time, had trained Dan Severin to be a professional wrestler. And then Dan got a chance in the UFC, UFC 4 out in Tulsa. Mm-hmm. And so... Dan came to me and he's like, you know, uh, you know, he knew, he knew how to wrestle, but he didn't know how to necessarily fight. They're two different things. And so I said, you know, when I look back at it now, we had no idea what we were doing, you know, we, because the UFC was so different because literally number one, you didn't know who you were going to fight at all. Number two, you didn't know, you know, like today, the UFC, the MMA has its own style. There's, all fighters have a ground game and they have a stand-up game. Well, back in those days, like Dan's a wrestler, he would face a karate guy or like that mm-hmm. night he had, to, he had to fight three times. The first fight was a Muay Thai fighter. The second fight was a long style karate fighter. And the third was jujitsu was, was Hoist Gracie. So there was no way to prepare or specify or train for a specific opponent because number one, you didn't know, who you were going to face. And number mm-hmm. two, you didn't know what type of style they fought when you did it. So we, you know, we just did our best. And so I ended up being, what, what was your record in MMA style? Well, I didn't, I didn't, you didn't fight have a in, in, no, I went and fought over in, uh, you know what my record was in, What's in that? zero and zero. It's zero. Because, <laughs> because <laughs> I put, James read, read me something earlier, said favorite holes. I said, any that don't hurt. That was my <laughs> favorite hole. Yeah. So, but, but you know, um, those MMA guys, he, they got to be just a, a different mindset. Uh, they're a different breed. Different. They're breed, nuts. Definitely. Dan, Dan was a different breed too, you know, but the, what got me the opportunity in Smoky Mountain was I was his cor- Dan's corner man and mm-hmm. Jimmy was watching the pay-per-view. I would known Jimmy since probably 84 mm-hmm. at that time, you know, and, and I would reach out to Jimmy and Jimmy never really had an opportunity for me in Smoky Mountain. And the reason why is I just didn't have any a personality he felt that he could sell. And that night, for whatever reason, the guy comes over to interview Dan after a second fight. And, you know, oh, you, you, you know, you, you just beat this guy. What are you going to do now to prepare for Hoist Gracie? You know, he's trying to get Dan to put Hoist over because the whole thing was the Gracie family. Mm-hmm. and Dan didn't say anything, and I was like, well, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to go back to the locker room and have sex, and I'm just being a smart ass. <laughs> and Jimmy saw that and was so taken with me being such a smart aleck that, he, you know, Eddie Gilbert was supposed to be Glenn Jacobs, uh, Kane's partner in Smoky Mountain, and he wanted a guy that could would basically run his mouth and start the fight, and then Glenn, mm-hmm. stop it. And Eddie had left to go to Puerto Rico because he had gotten an opportunity to have the book there to be the booker. And Jimmy needed a replacement. And he, after he saw me on UFC, he felt that I could do it. Well, about him going to Puerto Rico, I actually booked him in Puerto Rico, but it was before I left because I brought him in down there. And I heard that he had just walked out on Smoky mountain and he went down there and, well, hell, I had him there then. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And then, guess what? He walked out on me. Did he and really? Went, he, he, yeah, and he went somewhere. And then, to tell the story, uh, I left. And then Carla said, who do I get to be the booker? What do you think about Eddie Gilbert? And I said, well, I think he might fit. But I knew Eddie's ways. And yeah. he said, well, you call him? I said, no, I'm not calling him. Because I told you that, you know. If somebody has a substance abuse problem, right. Puerto Rico was the last place they you wanted to them to be. And I said, you can call him. I'm not calling him. So Carlos called him, set it up. And I, I think about two months later, they found him in his room 
he was yeah. dead, dead. Yeah. but they said he had a heart attack, but I think he may have had a little help with that. But anyway, that's neither here, here nor there, but so when you got to smoky mountain, what happened? Yeah. Uh, the very first day I came in and, um, I hadn't been on TV in years. So I went out, you know, work with George South. I love George South. What, yep. what an underrated, yes, underappreciated, he is. talented guy that guy is. Uh, seriously. Um, I could tell so many great moments with George in, in the <laughs> ring. And Jesus, so easy. Every time's a night off. Um, so I work with George. I spend most of the time being a heel, you know, just working the mm-hmm. crowd like it's a house show. And then I beat George in like 40 seconds. Yeah, and then I'm I'm heading over to you know Jr. who's doing the because I'm going to cut a promo, mm-hmm. and apparently Jimmy's in the back throwing desks, screaming because I didn't do it, you know. So when I walk back through, Jimmy is all calm and he's like, "Hey, hey, that was good, but could you go back out and do it again? Just work with George one more time, show what you can do." I go okay, and then I go back in and I beat him in about thirty seconds again. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy what was just, it? What was the what was the finish supposed to be? It was it was it was the fact that I didn't I didn't do enough on you know for a TV match. I did what it wasn't enough action. It was just I went I in. I talk I'd talk a lot of uh, BS and then I just beat him like mm-hmm. quick, you know. And um, it was there was no specific finish. It was the fact that you know I explained that yeah. today. I'm like, it's a TV audience. They have nothing invested. If you don't give them something to keep their interest, they're going to turn the channel. So mm-hmm. I didn't know that at that time. And uh, <laughs> that would have been Jimmy a good was, thing to know before that match. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah. But, you know, it, it, this business is not a very verbal business that people, you know, the guys don't really go pull you aside and go, hey, you need to know this, 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 this. They just. Figure you do, and then when you don't, they uh, so, try and fix it. Let's go with a little history here. So when you went to mm-hmm. Smoky Mountain, Ricky Morton had just left. Uh, Ricky was still there. Oh, he was still there. So why yeah. did Ricky did Ricky left though? Right? Or he did? Uh, did he just walk he out or something? Or huh, no, I think that was toward the end. Yeah, when I was gone, after I'd went to WWF, I think Ricky uh, then walked out at that point. You know, but at one point, weren't you and Unabomber uh, without yeah, opponents? We uh, no, we well, Jimmy had done an angle where I had took Ricky out, you know, in, mm-hmm. uh, in a Johnson City in a cage match. Um, uh, I had suggested an idea I'd seen when the Samoan SWAT team had done something down in uh, down the old uh, Fuller territory in Pensacola, and that where they. They came up from the underneath of the ring. So mm-hmm. if you remember, remember big Sam, he was part of the South African truth commission. I sure um, do. He physically looked like Glenn and Glenn used to wear that hockey mask in that cave. So we literally put in Johnson city, we put, you know, handcuff Robert to one side of the cage handcuff what was to be Glenn, but it was Sam to the other side of the cage and then put Glenn underneath. And then we just moved the boards out of the way, sliced open the canvas, and Glenn came up inside the cage, and we laid out Ricky. You know, oh, that was good for Johnson City. Yeah, yeah. They'd never yeah. seen something like that. Was New uh, Jack there? Oh yeah. How yeah. how was he to be around? I I'm, I only you met know, him a time or two. New I Jack heard a was, lot of you know, stories about him. Yeah, and they're probably all true. Probably. Uh, he was always, you know, respectful to me. Uh, he was charming. He was funny, but then, you know, there was that other side of him that he was basically a sociopath, you know, Mm -hmm. he was, you know, there were, he'd create these situations and create drama and, you know, and you just, you just knew that if you were to ever get in, go sideways with him, you're probably going to have to kill him or something. Do you remember when he threw the guy off the cage Oh, it and was the guy the almost scaffolding. killed himself. Vic Venom yeah, Vic was Grimes. his name. No, Vic, Vic Grimes. Grimes. Yeah, yeah. He and what was that? Him. What was that about? It was something that Vic had accidentally done to Jack and had injured Jack in a match months prior, and then you know uh, Jack fully went up went up there fully with the plan to you know try to hurt Vic, 
and tasered him and then tossed him off the thing head first. You know, Vic almost died. You know, no kidding. Just, yeah. He just got lucky. So when he threw him, mm-hmm. what did he hit first? He hit the turnbuckle or what? Uh, ropes or I think what? He, yeah, I think he hit, I think he hit, bounced off because they had, it was a bunch of tables stacked up yeah. or something. And he hit off of those. And then he hit the top rope and then rebounded off of that and against the ring apron and onto the floor. That's crazy. It was, it was ugly. I mean, it was really scary. And where, where was that? Where did that happen at? ECW. Wow. That's crazy. So let me, uh, James just showed me a picture here. Uh Uh-huh. And you're friends with Marty Gennetti. Oh yeah. Yeah. I love Marty. Okay. He's in the hospital now or he's injured. uh, He, you know, that all started Dutch when Marty and I were partners and it was right near the end of Marty was about to leave WWF. He was going to WCW and he rolled his ankle really severely. And he just, you know, you know, back then, remember we'd go out for, like I'd explain to people, like we'd go out for eight to 10, 12, 14 days in a row. Remember when oh, Jim yeah. Ross, JR oh, yeah. came to all, everybody and was like, Hey boys, we're only going to work you 21 days a month. You know? Yeah. He didn't, he didn't tell you that sometimes that might be all 21 right in a row. Oh, right you know. in a row. And they even went past that at times. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. tell the story. I hit 60 days without going home yeah. in a row. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I think back on what I was making, they wouldn't pay me nothing. Yeah. I was just staying well, busy. Yeah, business wasn't really good back then either. Either I mean, remember when we celebrated, we got a $100,000 house and we celebrated. It was like, oh, my oh, God, yeah. that's Oh, yeah, that's I amazing. remember that. Okay, and, uh, so Marty's in a hospital about his ankle. Have you seen the picture? Yeah. It's horrible. It's oh my god! Yeah, he James showed he, it to me earlier. I could not yeah. believe it when I saw it. He he, that was when we were partners. He rolled his ankle, kept working on it, and never went to the doctor or anything. And then just kept working on it for years. And then it, you know he went in for a surgery and got it repaired finally. And then contracted some kind of infection, and it, the infection's in the bone, and they can't seem to get rid of it. And, it, and uh, I saw the photo of his, his foot and his ankle, and it looks horrendous. It looks like a science project. Oh, it does. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it. Mm-hmm. And I said, James, why did you show me this picture? Because I'm uh, squeamish. I'm squeamish anyway. Yeah. So, but I hope he's okay. I, I, I like so Marty. Too. Marty, yeah. you know, he, he has his sides like everybody else. But when you get hurt like that, I, I hope him the best. Yeah, he. I don't think Marty gets the credit uh, that he really deserves to just how good he really was, and you know how much of a factor he was, and you know uh, he get, he got gets overshadowed by Sean, I think. Oh you yeah, know? a lot. And, yeah, and I and I think people don't really appreciate just how really really good he yeah he really was. Uh, you well, know, you got I, to I go- say that all the time. You you got to know Marty very well when you took Sean's place, right? Yes. And, you have a, mm-hmm. and what was that team called? Uh, the New Rockers. Okay. Which and how, Cor- how, Cornette, how always, that- Cornette always says that, you know, if you want the death of anything, put new in front of it right on the gate. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jimmy is always so encouraging. He, yes. he really is. Uh, so when you got to WWF. Yeah. Did you find the the drug culture to be kind of out of control, the pill culture. It was pretty heavy, you know, and it seemed like it got heavier the longer I was there. You know, when I first came in, you'd see a few people and it wasn't so open and out, but then as time went by, it seemed like it started to get worse and guys would, you know, be, would just be like that in front of everybody. Do you remember the trip, the Mm. European trip? That we mm-hmm. made, and I think you were on this. I'm pretty sure you were on this. That we got to London, and we mm-hmm. they had wrecked the first class cabin. They'd had a food oh, yeah. fight. A yeah. knife was sticking into the wall. They were oh, that was when we went to Kuwait. Seat. That was when we were with Kuwait, and we literally I didn't stopped go to, over. I didn't go. And, well, that that, that but was. But they kicked that was us off one. the plane. Yes, I remember they kicked us off the plane. Then the other one was when we went to Kuwait. And we were supposed to, we were going to do a layover, you know, stop over in Amsterdam 
and they were they were threatening to kick us off the plane there too um, because the boys up in you know business class and first class started going crazy and, and, doing, and that's nuts you know, and yeah. it's nuts I, I remember Davey, and this was when they used to have real cutlery and he threw <laughs> uh, a, a, one of the a, knives a knife at, stuck in the wall one of, and it's stuck in the wall yeah in the plane yeah i think i'm pretty sure because I didn't go to Kuwait, I'm pretty sure yeah. we were going to going to Germany. They threatened to. They did kick us off the plane. We had yeah, to get another airline to finish taking us to Munich, Germany, or wherever we were going. And they yeah. had to call the office, and the office was all upset. What's wrong with the frigging guys? And whatever. And Sabio Vega, I had him on not too long ago. He was a major uh -huh. cause of it. Him and him and Razor. Yeah, and I was yeah. I was telling James a little earlier, we had this match, you against Bradshaw. I remember. I, it, yeah. I remember he hit you with a clothesline. <laughs> yes. And I, the next thing I heard, I'm standing outside the ring, was Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Do I yeah. owe you money or something like that? And I didn't <laughs> want to laugh, but I had to laugh. And you looked at me and you said, what's the fuck wrong with him? <laughs> I, I said, I had, I, I'm out there saying, I'm begging off. I'm going, I didn't have anything to do with them. So I'm, I swear, I swear. Yeah. Oh, and then and in I, the locker room, in the locker room, because I had ran over and bumped you off the ring apron. You were like, oh, you were so stiff. I'm like, tell your boy, he's the one who's stiff, not me. Oh, I was kidding. <laughs> I don't mind that stuff, but he did hit you. And oh, that's yeah, the, he did. Uh, and you don't expect to hear, Jesus, back in Christ. <laughs> and you hold me a throat like, he down here amputated my head. Or, yeah, he dropped, uh, but, he dropped, and then he dropped the elbow on me right after uh, that. And I started cussing more. <laughs> uh, it's crazy, but how did your run in Smoky Mountain go? I went good. I mean, it was, um, I was really lucky. I got to work with, you know, Tony Anthony and Tracy Smothers and yeah, you know, it was I got a, it to work was a, a with Ricky and Robert. It was a good territory. Uh, yeah, I got to sit it, with you know with Buddy Landell, and that's another guy too. I don't oh think my Buddy, God. I don't think Buddy gets the credit for just how nope. really talented he was. I mean, he was good. he was so, and we've talked about this on this show mm -hmm. before. He was mm -hmm. so talented, he mm -hmm. didn't go to Atlanta TV one day. Yeah. He missed it. And the next week or two weeks later, they were going to put the title on him. I remember. And he just yeah. missed the TV. And the next thing I know, he was up there in Memphis mm -hmm. with me, making yeah. the trips where he could have been the NWA heavyweight champion. And yeah. I'm thinking, my God, buddy, how yeah. silly must you be? And, and when he passed away, I, I really felt bad. Because yeah. Buddy, he had a bad drug problem. He did. But he but he had a heart of gold. He, he was a really, really and, good guy. And but I remember he just, learning and, a lot. And he couldn't get rid of the demons. Of the demons yeah. had him and he couldn't he, he couldn't get rid of those demons. Uh, I learned a lot I learned a lot from Buddy being around him and just listening is to he, him. Is he is he funny? Oh my God. Do you remember <laughs> there was there was a night, right? <clears throat> We're in Ashland, Kentucky. Okay. Remember Sandy Scott? <laughs> you need you need some laughs being in Ashland, Kentucky. Yeah. You need something you to make remember, you feel better. Remember Sandy Scott, right? Remember he yeah, was I the remember road him. manager. Yeah. Yep. So so we're we're in Ashland, right? And Buddy is in the ring working with Dirty Boy Boy Tony Anthony, right? And a mark, a fan, jumps up on the ring apron and Buddy spins around, sees him, and throws a working punch. He slaps his chest <laughs> and throws a working punch. And the and the fan, like, here's the, you know, here's the, yeah. and sees his fist and kind of goes and freezes like, did he hit me? It, yeah. I heard it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the, everybody in the whole building went quiet as the fan didn't fall. The fan then starts, goes like, hey, I didn't get hit. He goes to go in the ring, and here comes Sandy from the front of the building running all the way back. Because Sandy's 50-some years, you know, almost yeah. 60 years old, tackles the guy off the ring apron and starts hitting him and going, that's the way you throw a goddamn working punch, buddy. 
boom, and he just keeps pounding him. And then the cops come and take him away. Well, the next day we're in, I don't know where it was in West Virginia. Buddy walks in and his elbow's all swollen up <laughs> where he had hyperextended his elbow throwing that working punch on the fan. So he got hurt throwing his own punch. Yes, yes. Oh, and my the fan God. never got touched. This is a thing that's never been explained to me, and I want you to do it for me. Mm. Where did the head gimmick come from? Uh, I, I love that gimmick. I loved it. The, uh, when I was in. You, you WWF, talked to the head and everything, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when, when I was in WWF, I was Leaf Cassidy. And, and, uh, and then I left because I knew I had, to, I had to leave. I had to go someplace else. They put me on loan to ECW. And I knew I had to get over there. So, but I, there were fans that knew me as Al Snow. And I knew there were WWF fans that knew me as Leaf Cassidy. And I thought, mm -hmm. well, you know, if anybody at that time, I'd been working for maybe 14, 15 years. And I thought anybody has been working that long at something and not, you know, things aren't turning out the way they are. At some point I'm probably going to have a nervous breakdown. And <laughs> if I'm Leaf Cassidy, <laughs> a nervous breakdown, that, Hey, that would right. be good. That's anybody's a good that idea. Happy? That was a good idea. So that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, anybody that happy if you're Leaf Cassidy has to be mentally unstable. You know what I mean? So, yep. Um, I literally started reading books on abnormal psychology and I read this case study that about a woman, she was a uh, schizophrenic and she had what they call transference disorder. So she would hear what was uh, it? voices, transference disorder. She'd okay. transfer her illness onto I'll, the objects she heard the voices from. I like it already. So I found a styrofoam head in the back and I thought, you know, I'm going to take this to the ring with me and treat it like it's a real person. And, uh, and then uh, it started getting over and um, Spike Dudley and Mikey Whipwreck found the beautician's head in a barrel that the fans would bring rep weapons for New Jack to use. And they gave it to me and said, here you mm -hmm. go. Here's a real head that, for you to use. And it just took off from there. Uh, there were so many things you could do with it. Oh, yeah. And if the people thought you were nuts, which they only had to watch you a little bit to figure out, that's the, yeah. they would think that you were that you were legitimately kind of off and you yeah. talked ahead and there were so many things yeah. that you could do with that. And you weren't limited. No. I uh, mean, <clears throat> when you're a cowboy, you're kind of limited to doing cowboy stuff and just, but that, that opened all the doors for you. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, claim like, you know, I was a, a comedian wrestler or whatever. And I wasn't, comedian at all i was an entertaining wrestler but the reason that it was funny was i didn't do it for laughs i did it because i was supposed to be insane which meant mm -hmm. i could get away with anything you know? anything anything at all and and you know they in dutch i had say what they want but i was on tv a lot during that run i mean oh, it got over uh, I was on TV on Mondays when we had SmackDown on Tuesdays. We did Sunday Night Heat. We did Saturday Night Velocity. I was on every one of those shows every single week doing something. You know, See, that's basically a writer's dream. Yeah, that's what you had because it was easy to write. Yeah. It was easy because you could just let go and talk about what you wanted to do with the gimmick, yeah. like the like head. Yeah, I mean, I would have loved to have it is I would have done a lot more with it. So, okay. In ECW. Yeah. Uh, weren't you supposed to have a match with Shane Douglas for the I title? Did. Are you did? I, yeah, I did. And they, uh, and Paulie, you know, had this idea. He was like, Oh, everybody's going to assume that you're going to win. And I think we, you know, we need to keep the belt on Shane. And mm -hmm. Shane was a mess. Shane had a broken arm. His, he had uh, sinus and all his nose was all mm -hmm. broken and everything. And, uh, uh, and I just, you know, I, at that time I had re-signed with WWF. I was on my way out anyways. Yeah. And, um, you know, we went and worked in Georgia uh, at the pay-per-view headline, the pay-per-view. And um, I put Shane over. Where, and, where was the pay-per-view in Atlanta? Uh, just Marietta. outside of Atlanta. Yeah, I think it was like Marietta. Where they used to do WCW TV. Yeah, yeah, I, me yeah. I remember the building. Yeah, and uh, I remember talking about this with Terry Taylor, and Terry was like, "Man, they, you know, 
you know, and this isn't me, this is in my opinion, but Terry and a lot of other people said that, you know, Paul made a big mistake. They should have just, everybody wanted me to win the title. He said they should have let me win the title. And then the very next week at TV, let Taz take it off. You know, if I'm, that's what I would have done. Yeah. But Paul wanted to keep it on. Yeah. Well, Shane. he owns a company. So I, yeah. I understand that. Yeah. What, can, can what I are you? Over... Sorry, Dutch. I, I want to continue on that briefly. Do you think if you'd uh, re sign, not sign with the WWF, but if WWF mm. had let you stay in ECW a bit longer, would the plans have changed yeah. and you would have been the champ? No, I don't think so. The reason that I did re sign, Vince Russo reached out to me, um, you know, pri- months prior about wanting, you know, he had seen what I was doing and he had talked to Vince McMahon and wanted to bring me back. And I was like, nope, I'm fine right where I'm at, Vince. You know, I'm happy. And um, and then a couple weeks go by, and uh, and I think Dutch can corroborate this um, for me. Oh, but, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't take the oath. You did. You have to tell the truth. Uh, uh, I'll tell well, a bunch the, uh, of big, a bunch of lies here. <laughs> well, the um, uh, I'm, was, I'm at Jerry Lynn's house. We're doing a run in Florida, like a four day run in Florida. And I'm in Orlando and I'm at Jerry Lynn's house and I'm watching the opening of the television show. They made a new opening of the television show, the ECW show. Okay. And I'm not bragging. I'm not, you know, at that time I was pretty much one of the most over I th- guys I think in the he, company. I, I think James, I think he is starting to brag here a little bit. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, uh, and, and I think you'll attest to this Dutch, the people you want to sell that you want to highlight, you put on that opening reel, you know, mm-hmm. the yeah. highlight reel. Well, I was nowhere on it, nowhere, nothing. And I was like, that is not a good sign that <laughs> that shows what my plan, what the Paul, yeah, what your plans were. Yep. Yep. So I picked up the phone that same night. I called Vince Russo. I said, and that was when we were still could send the VHS tape. I said, Vince, I'll send you a VHS tape. He goes, all right. Sent me, I sent the VHS tape and like, you know, uh, a week or two later, Vince McMahon called me and, uh, you know, I resigned to go back with WWE. Did, uh, WF. Who, who came up with the idea of all the styrofoam heads in the crowd? Uh, kind of, uh, it was kind of a group thing. It was Paul, it was me, it was, you know, uh, and, and then Paul, it, you know, Paul wanted it to look like, uh, it was a rave, you know, like a party whenever I came out and, the and Charlie and Ron, the camera guys, they were the ones that would turn the camera upside down and push it in and out. They came up with all of that, you know, and it, it worked. I mean, it was, it was, it was a great run. That's for sure. It was a lot of fun. So well, it was, and it they, was easy, easy to work with. I know that. And then the, uh, the the big the thing that got me over the most in ECW was not the wrestling. I tell people this all the time. I'd gotten hurt. I'd worked with Paul. Uh, I always forget his name. Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. Paul. Uh, he was with. Uh, uh, yeah, Paul. Uh, or- he was with the Orient Express. Wait a and I have no idea. I always forget. I always forget his <laughs> name. But uh, he, we worked in the arena, and Paul Heyman was had just came to me and he was going to, uh, I could tell he finally was starting to get behind the head gimmick. He was wanting me to come out and save Sandman, you know, and, uh, have the Sandman's t-shirt wrapped around the head or whatever, try and give me the rub from Sandman. And that, that night, uh, Paul went to give me a gourd buster. My arm got caught up underneath me and it completely dislocated my shoulder. And like, it was two weeks out from the pay-per-view from the November to remember pay-per-view Paul, Paul was, you know, going to have me work on the pay-per-view, but unfortunately I gotten hurt. So he put me in a, you know, Chris Candido, God bless his heart, politicked and got me a backstage vignette where I'm talking to the head and everything else is normal. And the next day, that was the one thing everyone talked about was that vignette. So if I'd have gotten a chance to wrestle, I honestly don't think I'd have gotten over near like I had by just simply being backstage and doing that vignette. And um, and that 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 was what really got it over. What really sold the character? Okay, Chris Candido in those days. What yes. year was this? This this was before he went to Puerto Rico. Uh, I remember when he went to Puerto Rico. I remember when he went to Puerto Rico. He had went. 
he was in WWF, had left and went to ECW. And he was kind of Paul's right hand man at that mm-hmm. time. And he said, okay, Puerto Rico was after that. Cause he talked about Paul a lot. Was Tammy yes. with him? Yeah. She had come along after that. You know, mm-hmm. she wasn't there initially with Chris in ECW. And then she got, she released. What's the WWE most game. fun you've had in the wrestling business? I mean, we talk about the bad times, the long trips, sometimes not yeah. getting paid. Tell me about the fun times you had. Of course, a I lot of them were with me, but I'll That's just let true, that yeah. slide right now. Remember the remember the night in Germany we went in that uh, adult bookstore and the <laughs> and the deal was you, yes. me, Barry, and Brian yes. Shaw and Glenn Jacobs, and we it was let's go find the weirdest video and then get everybody yes. else. And I came out of the video. You were booth throwing up. Packed. I was throwing up dry uh-huh. even because I saw a German Scheitzer video. And then you guys had me tell Jerry, Jerry Briscoe on the bus the next day. So he started throwing up too. <laughs> what was in that video? I can't even, you know, it was, so, it was a, it was a man, James. It was a video. Oh, that God. It was horrific because yeah, it traumatized me. <laughs> it did. Al came out and he's going, <laughs> I said, what the, <laughs> What in the man? You got it. He couldn't even no. tell me. And oh. just thinking about it makes me want to dry Eve again. I swear to God. So oh, it's bad. Listen, it's so bad. And that was the most fun he's ever. <laughs> <laughs> that was the most fun he's ever had. Is when he went into the porn store. So remember we went, then we went to the red light district and saw a couple live sex shows. Well, <laughs> what I in the audience doing that. I actually enjoyed that because <laughs> I finally learned where the red light name comes from. Yeah. You've been there, right, James? Uh, in Germany? I've never been to the I red mean, they, light thing. I've been to strip club, but I've never seen well, live shit. They got them. they had this these huge red doors, right? Yeah. They were like 10 foot high, but it was blocking a street. And they had them on the the end of this block and the end of this block, like a gate. And you open these big red gates and they were huge. And you walk in and that's where all they had the, they had all the strip clubs. And all the prostitutes. Yep. But that was interesting. And we went down uh, people. If you've never been, I'm talking to the guys right now. (laughs) They have storefront windows. Yes. And the girls sit in the windows. Yeah. And we, who did we have with us? It was me, you, Glenn Jacobs. Uh, Wasn't I think Harvey, Nick, Harvey Whipplestein with us or no? I think the pug, Alex Porto, came along with us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and Mick, Mick had joined us at one point too. Well, I forgot who was with us, but he pointed to a girl like you, me. I swear to God, the girl got up and just left. She actually quit that for that shift. (laughs) She didn't want to have nothing to do with with the Uh, guy. She she basically just turned him down in public. And I forgot who it was, but do you, do you recall anything like that? Or did I make that up? No, uh, I remember. (laughs) Uh, And and we ribbed him. You said, damn, it's pretty bad. (laughs) (laughs) It's pretty bad when the prostitute, when the prostitute rejects you. I hope yeah. you don't have any prostitute rejection feelings <laughs> going on this trip because we we can't straighten you out. Yeah, the job squad. Yeah, tell me tell me about that. I was a uh, a joke I had started when I was in WWF the first time. They were doing a big angle with remember they had the Los Bruicos, they had BSK. Everybody had a gang. You know what I mean? The click. Yep. Uh, everybody had a gang on TV, and everybody had a gang backstage. And because the locker room was so divided at that point because of uh, the click, everybody was had a lot. The click had a lot of heat back then. And uh, I told Jimmy one time we were sitting in catering and uh, I and said, undertakers gonna... undertakers click was known as what? B what? BSK. Okay. Bone Crusher Street Crew. Okay. And then, then there were the Cowboys that Dustin, the Smoking Guns and 
everybody had a group, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, except for us, we were just like the group of misfit toys. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and on, on the bus in Germany, <laughs> it was sectioned off too, right? Oh, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. The middle yeah. of the bus, that's where the bathroom is, or yep. the latrine. All the second squad or the second team guys sat up front. Yep. And all the guys in the clique yep, sat, sat in the back. back. I'll come back to that in a minute. But the bus was, it was separated too. It, we was, were segre it was segregated. We, actually, we were discriminated against. Yeah. I, 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 is it too late to sue, James? I think the, <laughs> I, I think. the, the statute of limitations <laughs> is 24 years. Oh, okay. No. Well, we're, we're yeah, past, we're past that. It. But go yeah. ahead. Uh, so where were you? I was in the catering and I was being a smart ass. And I told Jimmy, I said, I'm going to start my own gang. Jimmy's like, what are you talking about? I said, I'm going to start my own gang. It's going to be me, Barry Horowitz, Candido, uh, Aldo Montoya, uh, all the underneath guys. Uh, and we're going to be the most powerful gang there is. And he's like, what are you, how are you going to be the most powerful guy? I said, we're the job squad. You got to wipe the mat with us. Yeah. He goes, how is Barry yourself going to have power? I go, if Undertaker goes out there tonight and he tombstones Barry and Barry stands up and dusts off his hair and walks out, who had the power in that match? Yeah. I said, so there were a lot of the boys that really thought they were actually winning. And it was a way to kind of jokingly remind them, you're not really winning because I ain't really losing. Yeah. I'm doing you a favor. It's not like you're entitled to it. So don't disrespect me. And, uh, and it started as a joke and, uh, when I went to ECW, all the boys loved it. And they were like, you need to make t-shirts. So I made t-shirts and I think I may, I sold from March of that year to October of that year. I sold about nearly 4,000 t-shirts at $25 a shirt. Oh, you got to be kidding me. No, I'm not. 4,000 shirts. Yes. Yeah. Damn. And that was back. That was back before yeah. the internet commerce was a thing. I only would sell them on the internet and I would sell them at shows. That would be a collector's item now, right? Yeah. A big and, uh, time. I sold so item. many that WW when I went back to WWF, they had I signed a licensing agreement uh for them. And I I use this as an example, Dutch, because I tell all the young guys and girls, I'm like, you can when you get in the ring, the beauty of wrestling is you can do whatever you want once you get in that ring. Yeah, you're the it's center your world. You're the, you're the center, center of the universe. And own you can it. You do whatever you want. Yep, you can own it. But I said, you've got to make a choice. Okay. I, you know, I use the example. I like, you know, Job Squad made me a lot of money. I made, you know, four, more than four, almost 4,000 shirts at 25 bucks a shirt. I said, it was pretty good. I signed a licensing agreement with WWF and it never went anywhere because they did not know how to market the shirts to the casual audience so that where they would understand it and want to buy them. I was talking I said, about so, the casual. Uh, I was talking about the casual audience mm -hmm. just a day or two ago, right, James? Mm -hmm. That's when you get a sellout. When the casual yes. fans come, then yes. you have a sellout. Now you know you're doing something right, and that's so what continue. you want to market to. But everyone today always markets to just the wrestling audience, and I'm like, you have the choice. You can be Job Squad, you know, successful, which I was. I made money with those. So you can be Steve Austin successful. Whereas mm -hmm. his shirts were not just in Hot Topic or Spencer's Gifts in the mall. They were in Elder Beerman. They were in Lazarus. They were in Macy's. They were in Von Braun. They were in Walmart. They were in Target. They were everywhere. everywhere. And he, he made life-changing money off of those shirts. Mm -hmm. I said, whereas I made some money, but I didn't make the money. So you can choose to be Stone Cold Steve Austin merchandise successful, or you can choose to be Job squad merchandise well, successful. And that that deals Both in another are successful. Thing. Yes. You gotta take what the market offers and mm -hmm. make it count because that's what they give you. This is what I'm going to take. <coughs> right. Yes. Well, well, let me go. Was, let me go. Dutch, can go, I go so ahead, I, I James? I apologize to jump in. I want to um I don't want to harp on too much about the job squad, but uh I'm looking, there was five members in total. You, the Blue Meanie, Bob Holly, Dwayne Gill, Gilberg, and Scorpio. Were there any other, uh, two questions actually. One, did you have free reign to a point of who would be in the group? And two, was there anybody that you wanted to join the job squad that for whatever reason didn't happen? No, it was, you know, um, I think what they were trying to do at the time, and I'm not, again. He didn't please, ask me. Just, yeah. Well, I, yeah, you were with Bradshaw at the time. Um, 
the and Mick was also going to be a part of it at one point too. Um, and then it that was. got changed. Mick, Mick Foley. Yep. And and that got changed. Uh, you know, and all, it, this is all just speculation, but I think a large, you know, they didn't they didn't have a direction or an idea to do what something with uh, some of those guys, and I think they kind of put them with me to kind of you know see if they could manufacture something because. Like I tried to explain to Vince Russo, I'm like, I don't know how we're going to do this. The whole idea of this gimmick that was a joke was just to be to remind people that you're not really winning, so we're not really losing. So how do we put that on TV and sell that to an audience when the rest of the show is all about winning and losing? I mm-hmm. said, it, I said that makes no sense, Vince, and I, I don't know how we're going to be able to do it. And it just kind of, as a result, it kind of just floundered. It didn't really go anywhere or do anything. Because there was no way to really properly use it. What was the idea to get Mick in, or was it just a name suggestion and no actual creative to establish why? Well, it just kind of it kind of started, and then and then it and then the following week he was no longer a part of it. So he, they kind of put him with DX. So you know I wasn't privy to a lot of the you know direction or ideas of creative that you know especially I tell and it, this was my fault. I take responsibility, but I would show up. I can't tell you the entire time I was there in WWF, which was my fault. I would literally show up for matches, angles, uh, and no one would ever speak to me and tell me a direction or what they wanted or why I was doing it. The only person that ever really took the time to really, you know, have a conversation with was Brian Gewertz. Um, but as far as anyone else, I would literally show up and walk up. Oh, you're doing a pre-tape here. You know, you're doing this, you're doing that. I'd be in matches, you know, that would just come out of nowhere. I would be, you know, I one, I clearly remember one time they had me wear, you know, come out dressed as Vince McMahon wearing a suit and a rubber mask. And like, I was That's entertaining. Heads, I, I like he's, that. He's going to ball shot me, but they're not, they don't tell me what they want to do with it or why, you know, they don't even talk to me. They just, ah, here you go. And here's what you're doing and just walk away. And I, you know, my fault because I should have asked questions and you know, all of that, but uh, you, you just don't at the time. Nobody, nobody ever called me ahead of TV and Hey kid, we're thinking about doing this with you this week. And here's what we're hoping to accomplish. And, you know, we're, we're wanting to try and get so-and-so over or try to get heat this way. I could have done whatever their vision was much more effectively if they'd have just communicated more. But I don't think they knew. Yeah, I think you're right. I think sometimes no, I, they just I don't make it think up on the fly. They knew. And they said, well, the angle is getting over, the character is getting over without anything else. So I think they just let it run. Yeah. And see where they wanted to go with it. But I don't think they knew. But I yeah. love the character. I really did. There were so many things you could do with that character because, you know, if you weren't limited, that means creative wasn't limited either. And they could right. do any anything with it. Yeah. I, I don't want to get off this, but I, I want to ask you, do you remember on the Germany trip? Yeah. That all of a sudden, Tammy Fitch. Oh, yeah. Had to leave early. You remember she that? Did. Yeah. I think uh, because the way that the uh, whenever we go overseas, one everyone stayed at the same hotel. Uh, two, the heels went on one bus, baby faces went on another. Uh, you were for ground transportation to get between the towns, and then we would always go to the building, and we would eat once we got to the building, and then they would make the boxes, food boxes yep. that we could take back to the hotel after the show. Yeah, and she had uh, had a food box, and it was uh, rumored that one of the click had placed a rather large um, <laughs> turd in the food. Then unbeknownst, it up, unbeknownst to anybody un- else, unbeknownst to anybody, and then covered it up with noodles that were in. You know, they'd scooped out the noodles and made a little pocket, put the turd in, <laughs> put the noodles back on. <laughs> sealed it back up and then with her name on top of it with her name on top of it she came got it she and chris candido went to the hotel she was eating the food got through the noodles and discovered the very large uh turd uh while she after she'd already eaten several noodles and uh and 
uh, no uh, pun intended, shit hit the fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we got on the bus that day, and I, I've yeah. told this story before. Very quiet on the bus, wasn't it? Very quiet. It was uh, because the click, they weren't acting up. No. Because now they're thinking, oh, God, because one of the members was guilty of this, and they were trying to keep it quiet because things spread. Yep. And we knew what had happened. And Chris got on the bus and he was very quiet, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And, you know, and Chris was Chris was outnumbered. You know, it was a bad spot for Chris, you know. He, well, and I've told the story. They the were trying to get into the clique. Mm -hmm. They spent all that time up there. But what they did, they got up there and they pissed the clique off. Yep. Thus, the, the payback was the little was the a message. little noodle yeah the little message was the little noodle box yeah and chris had been used to sitting up front all of a sudden reverted back to sitting with the misfits in the back so we yeah. knew something I had remember, happened i remember they were they were in a bad they had bad attitudes because they were leaving the company after they got back remember then oh, shortly yeah, yeah. after the return from the tour they were going to Matt, we were going to Madison Square Garden, and that was their last show. And then they were going to WCW, remember? And so they they already knew they were on their way out of the company, and then and that was why they were just being well, such fucking, you know, they were <laughs> being assholes. What made you want to become a pro wrestler? It has to go back to the you kid days. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I people you ask have said, "Oh, I hate, time. I hated those kid days. I hated that crap." <laughs> <laughs> I I remember watching it when I was a kid. I remember just getting so, you know, enamored with it. And uh, if there was like I, an I, independent I, show close, you would go. Oh God, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, ringside, if, ringside. If, 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 if I could find it on TV, any any wrestling whatsoever, I could find on TV. I would find it and I would watch it. You know, I would. I bought every magazine. I. I, I, I bought books that I studied, you know, I, you know, I knew the history of the business. Um, I knew wrestlers in the fifth, from the forties and the fifties and the thirties. Mm -hmm. I, I was obsessed, you know, I had a poster and had all the NWA world title lineage on it at that time from back from Firma Burns on, you know, and, uh, um, I, I just was completely obsessed. And when I was 14, I made a conscious decision that that was what I was going to do. And, and I didn't have a plan B and I've been able, I've been <laughs> blessed to be able to do it for 41 years. And, and, you know, it's been awesome. So do you deliver the, do you tell this story talking to your students, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do I've, they I, have you know, similar I've, experiences? They would just want to be a wrestler. I don't, I don't know Dutch. I really don't. I think, Nowadays, it's changed. I, mm -hmm. I think two factors. One, I, well, I'll, I'll give you a good example. Okay, I was we were I was doing TV review here in OVW one night, and I was talking about the fact that you know I didn't get I got signed with WWF, and I had been wrestling like thirteen years or something at that time. And the, one of the kids goes, 13 years? You took you thirteen years to get signed?" I go, "Yeah." So what? He goes, "It's thirteen years." And you weren't signed. I go, I didn't get in the wrestling business to get signed with a particular company. I got in the wrestling business to be a wrestler. And, and that was the big difference. I realized then that was the big difference because everyone that gets in now, the only reason they get in is to get signed with WWF period. Mm -hmm. It's all about the destination. It's not about what they're doing. It's about the destination. And, you know, and then if they can't or they relegate themselves to the belief that they can't get signed with WBF, they just want to be signed by some company. As long as they've signed and they can kind of hold that, that you know, look at me, I'm now signed, I'm a step above everybody else, they're thrilled. And that for me wasn't why I got in the business. I wanted to get in the business because I wanted to do this for a living. And I wanted to, my goals were to be able to make a living doing it. Has, a, um, has AEW reached out to you? Uh, no, uh, have I've talked, you, you know, we've had some, we had some conversations. Have uh, you sent any ago. of your guys there? Oh yeah. Yeah. 
a lot of guys have went there and worked, you know, dark matches. I've got a tag team called the Outrunners that work on Ring of Honor and AEW quite frequently. Mm -hmm. And uh, Layla Gray is under contract with AEW. She's still here on a weekly basis as well. So has anybody ever contacted you about NXT? Uh, no, never. No. Yeah, I was watching their product the other day. Mm -hmm. All their girls are beautiful. Oh, yeah. They are. Mm -hmm. But they all look the same. Yeah. Well, and they all, they're all very redundant. All the guys, all the girls uh, there. Yes. They're very redundant. The matches are very redundant. You know, they're very overproduced. Um, and I think what's missing today is the art of selling, knowing, selling, you know, knowing how to sell, knowing what you're selling. Most of all of the talent today sell what they do. They try to convince the audience that the moves are real. And what we, what everyone used to do was convince the audience of who they were was real and that why they were doing it was real. Sell the audience because the audience wants to believe in your intent, not in your actions. They want to believe that whatever you're doing, you're trying to do to win and not lose. You sell the consequence of the action that's been done to you. Not that you're hurt, that if it gets done again, you might lose. That's where the real storytelling comes in. And that's where the real drama comes from in a match. No, but no kidding. I was every, talking about, I was talking about Bret Hart the other day. Yeah. He could sell, but his face never changed. Never changed. No. Am I right on that or not? Uh, he was stone faced. Yeah. And yeah. his face needs to tell the audience tell the story i'm in mm -hmm. trouble i'm hurting this guy down here about ready to kill me but I his face lose. never changed yes absolutely yeah. so i'm watching nxt yeah i'm that's watching nxt and i'm saying wow this is i mean they can do what they want to do no oh, yeah. not it's not my it, it's not my ability is amazing okay this brings up another thing i want to ask you about mm -hmm. the guy they do believe in wwe Mm -hmm. They pushed heavy and they mm -hmm. made the, one of their best choices. I think they've made in years is Gunther. Well, I do. I agree with you, but they, they're, they're cutting the legs out from underneath him. The what way are they, they doing book, now? Well, well the, the way they book certain matches and that guy, Gunther has the size and was getting over in a way to where you could, and you'll understand this to where he could work programs with guys like Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns. And that's that's what they need, but you mm -hmm. can't have him work with Sami Zayn and my, and uh, um, Kevin Owens and go 50, 50 with a guy like him. No. You got to have Gunther take 70, they get 30 or 80 and they get 20 because you want to push him to where he's going to be working. He needs to be a threat for Brock Lesnar. Well, if it's 50, 50 with Sami Zayn, how is he going to be where for the audience, they're going to believe that he's going to be a threat for Brock Lesnar. Yeah. Or well, Reigns? I agree. I agree with that. But see, I, I must, poor, I must admit, booking. see, I don't watch raw. I don't either. But when I first saw him, I said, he's the second coming of Johnny mm -hmm. Valentine. Right. Yeah. Because Valentine went in there and there was no bullshit to mm -hmm. Valentine. There was no performance. Mm -hmm. And I'm Johnny Valentine folks. If you don't know who he is, look him up because he made believers out of fans. Yeah. That sat at ringside when he would chop Wahoo. Yeah. And you could hear it all over the arena. So if you can hear it, you know it had to be laid in pretty hard. Yeah. But and Johnny Valentine had a favorite saying they might think the business might be fake, but they'll yeah. damn sure know that I'm not. Right. And, yeah. he, and he lived by that. So Gunther, mm. I, I think if they'd have kept him true to his roots and it, and it's not too late to go back to it, no. but I mean, and you, you made the right, the uh, wording that he could work with anybody. Yeah. He could work with the heel and he'd be mm -hmm. the baby face or he could work with the baby face and he'd be the heel and he wouldn't even have to change yeah, at all. So, but I, 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 I think this is not, this is not a podcast about WWE. But it's a podcast about, you know, the, the way these guys are working now. So mm -hmm. in your school, what do you teach? I teach to sell who and sell why. That's what I teach. I, I even break up the curriculum in the in, in the in-ring wrestling. 
The, ba- the beginner's course is to teach basic fundamental wrestling, timing, distance, and footwork. You're not going to be hitting the ropes. You're not going to be taking turnbuckles. You're not going to be doing dives. You're going to learn just to wrestle and sell the why, sell the intent. Make me believe that you're, you're using the moves you have to really win a match and trying not to lose. Pinning so combinations, you, escapes, reversals. Do you do the actual instruction? Uh, I have teachers that I teach to teach the right way. Okay. I have an intermediate class. That's where they start to learn the who. They start to, now they hit the ropes. They take bigger bumps, but they also start learning how to, hey, here's how you're going to communicate being a heel in the match, and what you would do and why. Here's how you are as a baby face. And, you know, and then I have the advanced class uh, with Doug Basham, Doug was a former WWE guy, and mm-hmm. he starts on real, where now let's start figuring out who you really are and how you can sell that to an audience and, and now, within the, a wrestling match. Now you start working with character development, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to teach the them not to perform or not to wrestle. I'm trying to teach them to work a wrestling match. So I think that, Dutch, I think that definition has been lost. You know, I don't think people know what that word really means anymore. What is that? Work to work a match, you know, to work an audience. I tell, I tell them the definition of a work is a con. It's a sham. It's to make an audience believe a lie. And the only lie in wrestling is I'm going out there to really try to win. That's it. (laughs) Uh, Yes, that's true. Uh, If somebody wants uh, that are listening, that wants to be a wrestler. Yes. I want to get into the wrestling business. Mm-hmm. I want you to tell them uh, how, how to contact you. Uh, they can go to the website, ovwacademy.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are the only accredited as an actual trade school for professional wrestling, sports entertainment, and broadcasting in the world. We don't just teach in-ring wrestling. We also teach camera operation, lighting, sound, event management, financial management, Um so that when in the day comes and you no longer can wrestle in the ring, you'll still have skills that you can now, you know, be a part of the wrestling business and be a, uh, an addition. And give that name again, backstage. OVW.com. OVWacademy.com. 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 Yep. Remember, OV, say it again, people. OVWacademy.com. So if you're interested in wrestling or doing anything, because this is the guy that can show you how James, give me some questions. Al, have you got time for one? Have you got time for five? I got, I got time for a couple more cause I, it's TV day. So I got to hop off here in a few minutes. Uh, what, Otherwise I'd stay on all day. <laughs> oh, dude, I'd love to have you on all day as well. But uh, there's one thing that Dutch I was hoping would mention and sort of got skipped mm-hmm. over in your early days is until recently, I didn't realize that you had wrestled Bruiser Brody. In the oh eight, yeah, I wrestled all league. those guys. Oh, you've got to you've got to yeah. tell me about Brody especially. Well, uh, uh, you know, I was back during when I would go from different TVs to different TVs. You know, so I was coming in for Vern, and you know, I'm sitting there with my, you know, the guy <laughs> that was I was riding with, and then walks Abdul the Butcher and Bruiser Brody, and I'm like, my heart just sinks because I they would always put me because I bump really well for these guys, you know. And I was like, oh, here we go. I, you know, I'm just dreading it. Right. And, uh, they, they, uh, Oh, I wish I'd have been a fly on the wall then. Oh, it was terrible. (laughs) And and back then, you know, Brody had a reputation, you know, especially with all the job guys, he could get, he could get rough. I mean, but he was doing it to protect his own business, you know? So he had apparently just been in Missouri and we'd, I'd heard stories about, he beat the living shit out of one of the job guys down there. And I'm just sitting there thinking, please, God, please don't, don't put me in the ring with this guy, please. Right. So, um, they, you know, Vern comes over and a, uh, you know, it was, it was Wally Carbo comes over and goes me and the, my buddy, Hey, we're going to have you guys work a handicap match with Bruiser Brody. And I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. Right. And literally <laughs> like just a couple weeks before I was in Missouri, and um, Bill Orwin's brother, Scott Irwin, he was the dude, super destroyer. And I'm sure it was because I was some dumb kid. He was trying to smart me up in the ring, and he was he was hitting me in the back of the head as hard as he could and just repeatedly doing it. And I couldn't see out of my left eye for about a half an hour after he got done. And so I go up to Brody, and I go, look. You know, Brody goes, hey, uh, Morgan, are you kid? And I go, 
He goes, just fight back. Just fight back. I go, oh, okay. Well, you know, I just, if you would, you know, whatever you do, sir, just don't hit me in the head. And I explained what had happened a couple weeks ago. He goes, don't worry, kid. So we go out there and he just starts eating us up. You know what I mean? He's just mowing us down. And you know how you can feel the rhythm of the match. Dutch will know what I'm talking about. Well, you know, the finish is just about to come up, right? He does that huge jump and knee. And I'm like, there's no way I'm taking this. I'm going to make sure I'm on the outside of the ring before that happens. Well, he has me by the back of the head. He walks over, lifts up his legs, just kicks straight out and smashes, kicks it the my partner's face, right? Kicks him so hard that he's hanging on the rope and he doesn't bump. And I hear Brody growl and he goes, take a bump, kid, and kicks him again. His nose just goes quick and he shoots off the side of the ring and hits the cement and slides away. Brody slams and he goes, don't move. I see him out of the corner of my head, go way over in the corner, comes running, jumps up. He's, I, I'm like, I'm going to die. He's 10 feet in the air. Uh, at least. I, I'm like, I'm going to die. And he drops, <laughs> never touches me. Hooks my leg, tells me thank you. And I was like, oh my God, somebody must have been looking out for me. I, cause I thought that was the end of, I thought I was going to die. Came back to the back. He thanked me. I said, thank you for not hitting me in the head. He goes, oh, I appreciate you fighting back kid, but I'm just going to beat you up every time I go. No problem. <laughs> you ever take an elbow from, uh, Abby Abdullah? Oh yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Is that yeah. pretty solid? Uh, it's very solid. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Somebody told me we talked so about big, it yesterday. You know, he, Oh, he's, he's so, so big. big. He, remember back then he couldn't even zip up his boots. He couldn't no. bend over to zip up. He his don't boots. do an elbow drop. He does a body drop. Um, yeah. He just drops you. his whole body on you. He hit yeah. me with it one time. I went, yeah. I had the same reaction you had when Bradshaw yep. hit you with that closed <laughs> eye. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> Except I didn't say nothing. I just, I just got up and left. So you got yeah. one more question, James, for, so we can let this mm. this man go to his training class. A few people wrote in and said, have you got any funny stories or otherwise of star maker Kenny Bolin? Star maker Kenny Bolin? Oh, I got plenty of <laughs> stories about old star maker Kenny Bolin. He is, he is a rare bird. That is Breed. Sure. Yes, he is. Oh, he is. Uh, Kenny will tell you the story himself. And this is the best way I can, when people ask me about Kenny, I can tell you there used to be a, 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 a grocery store, a shopping market where named Kroger's and they did a double your money back meat offer. So if you would buy meat and you didn't you weren't satisfied, satisfied with it, you would return the meat when that was uneaten and you get double your money back. So Kenny figures this out and starts buying like going to different stores around the city and he's buying like a huge roast. that's like seven or eight pounds. It costs like at that time, like a hundred dollars. He eats half of it, takes it back to another store that he didn't buy it from with the receipt. So they don't recognize him. He then gets $200 back. So he, he starts doing this and builds a territory of stores. And then it starts. This was the best part. He starts now basically franchising that out to his family members. And they did this for at least a year with this double your money back meat scam until Ma Bolin, the mother, uh, went in the same store twice and got caught. And then Kroger's cut the program off. So that, that, uh, that right there. He and when he tells you the story, he's proud of it. That he oh, yeah. was able to figure it out. So that pretty are, much Are you are everything. you claiming that Kenny Bolin may have scammed somebody? Are you saying uh, that? Ken, I didn't claim anything. Kenny proudly proclaimed oh, okay. that he scammed people. You know, you know yeah, he'd be bummed out if he said scam. He preferred meat opportunity rather than meat, meat scam. Opportunity, yes, that's that's it's all about opportunity for him. And <laughs> he's not uh, that that guy's yes. not boring, is he? Never, never, never. And I that, mean, I don't care what you got. He's uh, and I, I think Dutch will attest it. when when like when I broke in in '82, and Dutch, you can 
every single person in this business were one, some of the most intelligent, most eclectic, most eccentric people you'd ever meet. And you knew that if they were not in the wrestling business, they'd be in jail somewhere. <laughs> A lot of them. I, I could say that is true. Yes. And, and they are creative. They yeah. are entertaining. Yes. And if they had to work a regular job, they'd go, uh, nuts. They'd go nuts. Yeah, they they'd could, go nuts. They, they, they couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. What's your final no. question there, Mr. James? Oh, that, that was my final question. I can always ask more, question. but we've got to let Al go. Uh, we got to let him go, folks. I'd like to I have you back on. Uh, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're one of my favorite people in the business. I always uh, enjoy well being much. around you. He says that to everyone. Always... <laughs> no, I, I've only said this to Al. I didn't say this to Kenny Bowling, did I? No, no, in fact, didn't. I said, Kenny, you're an entertaining son, best. Now get the hell out of here. No, I didn't. <laughs> I, I like Kenny. Listen, go to yeah. your class, teach those guys, tell them you just did a one hell of a interview on story time with Dutch. And uh, folks, if you want to be a wrestler or just pass it around, it was ovwacademy.com, com. correct? Yeah. Right there. Yep. And. He'll, he'll set you straight. He'll be right back to you. So until we're back next week, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Mr. Al, you can join us. Yes. We, to. the people. <laughs>